Welcome everyone uh, to this Systems Ontario Sciencing and Philosophizing. So if you could uh, just identify yourself, where you're uh, where coming from, and the question of, have you ever heard of pragmatism? And I'm going to start with Elena, because she's first on my list. Hi, Elena Leonard, uh, downtown Toronto. And yeah, I, I heard of it. Um, I haven't done much with it, uh, but we did read Purse in university. Cool. Um, Andre, please. Hi everyone. So I mean, uh, also in Toronto, used to be part of, uh, I think the little, little brother of uh, Systems Thinking Ontario, that was Systems Thinking on the Toronto. Uh, and I've heard about pragmatism before, but uh, I, I, I'll have to refresh uh, my knowledge on that. Thank you. Mr. Hawk. Mm. Uh, I once asked a banker for a loan without collateral, and he asked me if I'd ever heard of pragmatism. pragmatism. <laughs> and I said no. Then he explained pragmatism and didn't give me the loan. I love those explanations. Michael Liebman. Hi, I'm in Philadelphia, and um, we deal with it a lot because we do modeling in disease in medicine. Hey, nice. Charity? Um, you're muted, Charity. Did you want to say I think something? In the chat. She said in a chat. Oh, she's in the chat. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Thank you, people. Okay, and Kelly. Where is she? Oh, she's gone. We'll come back to her then. Uh, Nishat. Yeah, uh, Nishat here, close to Toronto in Waterloo. Um, Wishing I was in Detroit or Buffalo instead, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think I think I, I I first read a little bit of William James, uh, the psychologist. I think var varieties of religious experience, um, and maybe a little bit of Dewey when I was eighteen years old, but I didn't really know it was uh, called pragmatism or any such thing. That was my first exposure. Thank you. Kelly's sort of not sitting down yet, so we'll go to Zad. Hi, everyone. Uh, Zad here from Toronto as well. Um, I'm not, I can't be on video today, but just wanted to call in. Yes, I've heard of pragmatism. Um, I'm not ultra familiar with it. I've heard a lot surrounding it, perhaps, but um, so I've, I, I'm familiar with William James and others, and I'm really curious to uh, understand better the connections between pragmatism and systems thinking um, and where that thread is today. Thank you. Kelly, did you want to say something? Do I want to say something? Uh, Are you I, I can see Dan, Dan's turtle, and that's it. <laughs> that's that's a big problem for you, you know. <laughs> Come on, I just see your, your turtle and that's it. But okay, I'm, I'll turn on the video, mode. then you can see me. I, I've got company here. Okay. Did you want to tell people at all whether you um, had some exposure to pragmatism? I guess, guess that was a maybe. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> okay. 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 That's, that's easy. <laughs> that was easy. So I'll just uh, quickly say I'm Dan Ng from also from Toronto, or as people have noticed, I'm a turtle. And uh, I was really pretty excited about our topic today because, um, as David said, perhaps we're, we're, we've been searching for these answers in a convoluted places and it's right in front of us. Just go back to religion, you know, pragmatic view, I suppose. Kind of like the whole uh, process here because of our need to reflect on all these things that are happening. Thank you. I guess, David, do you need to introduce Mr. Metcalf or, or is he going to introduce himself? Or so I'll do the uh, a very brief uh, introduction of the, of this whole topic, which is um, so I need to write papers. I'm in paper writing mode, um, 
Gary uh, had read uh, the Metaphysical Club, and we started having discussions about it, actually, when we're in Lithuania. And it's like, oh, um, maybe we should dig into that a little more. And then I, I, I started listening to it and didn't realize that when he heard it, he was listening to many hours of a audio book on a drive uh, as he drives a lot. Um, so we're, we've teamed up and we're going back and forth a little bit on trying to understand um, pragmatism. And there's actually a lot of interest right now. Uh, Mike Jackson has been writing things in systems research and behavioral science that we need to get back to uh, philosophy and a philosophy under system sciences. Um, so uh, today is actually a open discussion. Um, Gary and I, when we're working on the presentation for, uh, for the ISSS meeting in South Africa, uh, we decided to get down to basics, uh, but the time there was rather limited. So um, as I always say, I'm a researcher, I'm not a teacher, Gary's a real teacher. And so um, we, we're going to try to go through the basics and then uh, we may expand from there. We'll see where the conversation goes because I'm still in the middle of writing this paper and even struggling with Gary trying to be understood. Um, Gary? <laughs> Thank you. So if you want to bring up the slides, David, um, sure. we're going to tag team this for sure. So let me give you a bit of background. This, I, I think most of you are familiar, obviously, with David and with a good bit of his work. So we will probably lightning round through um, some of this more than we would with other audiences. When we were talking about presenting this at the IWS in South Africa, um, really had no idea who the audience was going to be, and we had to assume that it was going to be at least probably a third, half, maybe people who were um, not even particularly oriented to systems science, much less to any of the work that David's been doing with the, the folks in Toronto. So that's the backdrop for this. Um, the way I chose because of that to present the ideas was less of a, here's a presentation of evolving theory per se, and more, here's an exploration of um, a lot of existing theory, which David's been building on with, you know, I think half of you have been involved in this for some amount of time with him. So um, it's it really is the, the whole idea of pragmatism is not trying to explain or define that. It's certainly in this presentation, it's frankly easier than trying to explain what pragmatism is to explain that it was as much as anything a backdrop against sort of traditional Western science, assuming that it was the gold standard for everything that everybody did. So let's move on um, and get into the slides. So a lot of the backdrop goes back to um, the, the San Jose conference when David was IWS president that year. And the people he brought in and the beginning of the questions, um, if you're going to get serious about changes from a systemic view, what does that really mean? Different from other forms, types of change, um, what would make change systemic? If you're going to tell an organization or a group of people, you know, yes, we present a different kind of way, we're going to do something that is not just traditional consulting or not traditional approach, what we take is a systemic approach, what does that mean? And so some of the questions, you know, is it a different theory of change? It, does it involve design thinking? Does it involve specifically systems, ideas, or theories? So next slide. So here again is, is this backdrop about Western science. And, and this is the problem. Um, if you're studying molecules and gases and rocks, traditional physics-based Western science is pretty useful. You know, and so all the, the traditional things people think about, um, the development, well, measuring, first of all, observable and measurable, uh, developing a hypothesis when, which can then be tested. But the whole idea is to move towards some kind of a cause and effect explanation. So, you know, my work, you know, for the 20 years that I taught in universities was really in social science of varying kinds. It gets a lot harder there to say that what we're going to do, that the research standard is that whatever's gonna be done is generalizable. 
Okay, so the the assumption was we we can take a specific sample of people, or we can find characteristics, and we can say that those are representative of some larger body. And ultimately, if the research is really strong, then it leads to this idea that we can predict future behavior. Which again, if you're working in the realm of physics, is not so far fetched. If you're if you're working with groups of people. It's just a whole different challenge. So next. <clears throat> so a lot of the, the foundations that I think you've been working with, David, through the group, um, you know, in different ways, really has come back to the work of Emory and Trist and Tavistock um, as, you know, foundational ideas, as ideas from which to work forward and backward in this case, I think. So Tavistock really um, started as a group of volunteer psychologists um, around World War I, <clears throat> treating what would be considered probably post-trauma today. They were working at a community level. So if you think about the kind of trauma that folks in Ukraine are going through right now, it's a lot closer than thinking about sort of a removed post-trauma of soldiers coming home from some foreign field. The trauma was experienced at a very collective level with the soldiers, with the families, with the communities. And what they began to see was there was no way to just separate out how you were going to help folks in that environment because the, the trauma was experienced at the entire community level. So the people they brought in to start working on the problems included psychologists, but it also was anthropologists. It was people in varying um, fields of medicine. And so, again, they were working on, I think, uh, average was about four hours a week that a whole group of them would trade off volunteering, working with folks. That that was the first couple of decades of the Tavistock work. It evolved into Tavistock, then working with the British military later, Eventually, that transformed into Tavistock working more formally with organizations. That was associate technical work. And then as that expanded and, you know, both their ideas and their practices expanded, it, it began to encompass social, social, social ecological systems as the, the theory and the perspective. So next. Here's an application just to explain it maybe a little further. In, in traditional um, psychology in the U.S., so there, the, there were organizational psychologists working with the military in World War II in the U.S., selection of people like candidates for officers. Tavistock, in some of their applied work, the organizational side was doing exactly the same thing with the British military. Took two completely, well, two significantly different perspectives about how they approach that. In the US, the assumption was we were gonna rely on this traditional view of science. And so we were going to look for traits like leadership that would tell us how certain soldiers would perform and we would use those extracted traits to decide who would be the best leaders, put them into training. And we assume that if you could extract whatever those leadership principles were, you could replicate them and that would give you the results you wanted. Tavistock was working from much more of a situational perspective, really from the beginning, even in things like military selection. They wanted to see how soldiers would act and react in situations. They used that as a best fit and just basically took a different approach. So the foundations of the way that psychologists in the U.S. and particularly in the Tavistock group were working represent a different approach to not only organizational work, but really to, um, you know, the, the Tavistock group was a much more systemic group in, in their work and approach. So next. So you have varying influences coming into what became the socio-technical perspective and the socio-ecological. So again, these you know different influences, which I'll I'll let David explain a little bit further when we get to the discussion about how all that came together. So next. 
this is a, a, a different description about how the ideas got applied um, in terms of systems and environments. So the L11 was what became the descriptor for a system itself. The um, nomenclature of two was the environment. So L22 was looking at the environment. L11 was looking at the system. What was important was the influences of them on each other. So L21 was the influence of the environment on the system, the environment on the person, if you would, in some cases. <clears throat> L12 was the influence of the person on the environment. There are different um, theorists and philosophers that built into where all this came from, which we can talk about a bit more, um, from a, a, psychi a psychiatrist named Anders Angio, who heavily influenced a lot of the Tavistock work for a time. The L12 was autonomy. It was the expression of the individual on the environment. L21 was heteronomy, the expression of the, um, the environment on the individual. Those were never absolute. There were always a balance of perspectives. But in this interpretation, you now move into the, the influence of the environment on the individual creates learning. The influence of the individual on the environment is a, a process of planning. When you put those into action on the right side, over time, you have a starting condition and the learning and the planning are moving towards a particular goal. So next. This is where David and I, I know those of you who've been involved have started pulling in the, the philosophical work from Pepper. Now, Pepper was basically a contemporary of Anders Angio. Um, you know, although they just, I think they ran a parallel, and I don't know of any direct overlap of their work, but they both were influential in what became the perspectives from Tavistock. So mechanicism, I'm sure you're familiar with, that's really traditional, you know, mechanical and very physics-based kind of science. <clears throat> Formism is curious. My best interpretation of that is it's a whole lot more like biology in that it really represents categorization without attempting to um, create any kind of cause effect. So it's understanding the variations and the differences according to how we can categorize differences like different species. Um, but it's different than assuming that you can create a cause and effect in mechanism or other, you know, other traditional kind of approaches. Organicism and contextualism I'm going to pump those as well for David to explain further his interpretation and how he's used those when we get to the discussion. So here was, um, th this was, I don't know how long it took you to put this together, David, but it was a really useful slide to begin to look at some of the influences over time. So if you look to the, the far left, you've got Purse and James, who were contemporaries and both were involved in the development of the ideas that became known as pragmatism. Each of them, along with um, along with some of their own contemporaries, every, every one of them came up with kind of their own different variation and explanation of how they saw pragmatism. But more than anything, it really was meant to be an alternative to traditional reductive Western science. Singer was a student of James, even though he appears you know, very close in the same time. The importance of the lineage goes all the way over to West Churchman, kind of the middle of the right side of the slide, who was a student of Singer. So you go from, you know, <clears throat> Peirce and James working together to Singer as the student, to West Churchman as the student, and Churchman really becomes a center point of influence of what had become now the systems, system science movement and the people involved with that. So um, Rosakoff was a was a student, I guess the first student really of, of Churchman at a doctoral level. Both of them were involved in discussions and research and work and writing with the Tavistock group, including uh, Fred Emery and Eric Trist. So as the exploration has continued, 
and this I will give you my description and David can fill in much and, and the rest of you have been involved and, and do a lot better um, discussion about you know where this has come from and, and what it's really meant. If you take something like trying to explain how music works, if you think about music as a process over time, it's not terribly different than other kinds of human endeavors. Right? So you've got patterns that are understandable, predictable, replicable in different ways. You've got patterns which are pretty typical in that they work or not. So in music, you've got um, kind of an evolution through a song, through an entire score of resonance and dissonance. And a, an attractive piece of music, something that will attract most people's ears, involves both and requires both. So it actually is a flow over time in order to produce something that is understandable, recognizable, or considered valuable, you know, in terms of ethics, beauty, appreciation, whatever. Um, part of this exploration is if you accept that you can look at that as an example, then how do you translate that into something more formal, into something like a, you know, the, the patterns, the dyads that um, could be used to describe not the notes and not the players and not the music, but the, the pattern and the rhythms over time. So next. And now you get into this translation or you know, for me, it's uh, really an ongoing exploration. If you understand that these patterns do represent, you know, things much broader than just, you know, a particular um, example of music or physics, you know, light waves, whatever, that they are, they probably represent something larger, if not actually universal, then you can get to connections with things like yin and yang and get to alternative philosophies. And in that realm, then, you've got understandable patterns that are not necessarily in harmony or that they can be identifiable. You know, they, um, the, the work of people like Lynn Trancali, who was, I think, has continued to explore things like pathologies over time. Are there patterns that you can use to understand where things are out of balance or dysfunctional or, you know, in need of attention according to however they're working but also affecting and working within the environments where they exist and when you begin to put all of those together now where you're questioning things like the patterns as rhythms you're questioning processes over time and you begin to compare those to ancient um, theories philosophies about um, explanations, then can you begin to put these together in ways that bring a bigger picture, that bring some, some better understanding across a, a variety of different philosophies, Western and Eastern, that begin to make better sense um, as you bring these into then a focus of potentially new evolving theory. And that's my part. And we're in discussion mode. <laughs> we're in the very, very basics here. Um, so to tell you where um, I am, so we've had previous discussions about um, world hypotheses, um, and that's somewhat familiar to, to most people. Uh, the um, idea of mechanism uh, very common that people are saying well you should should not look at systems mechanically uh, and and you should look at them as organisms um, but there are systems that are mechanical systems and perhaps we should look at them that way uh, in addition to that though the the beginnings of all of this backs up to the paper that david hawk loves the causal texture of organizational environments where the question i asked was what do they mean by causal texture? Um, what is that all about? And um, and so that that's been the exploration of looking into texture that's backed me into 
Pepper, then looking at Pepper and trying to understand, well, what was West Churchman doing at the same time? Because they're supposedly both coming from the school of pragmatism. Well, they have things in common, but then they're working on totally different areas. Um, the, the part that, um, uh, that I've been grappling with over the past week, and if, if you look on coevolving.com, there is a really brutal blog post um, on um, on trying to understand methods of inquiry, which uh, I may lean on David Hawk a little bit because he had to study as a grad student many years ago and keep saying it's uh, the work that's worth reading. Um, I, I have to say I've skipped most of the chapters. Um, I've, I've actually gone just to the punchline because uh, <laughs> I've read some of the stuff before. Um, so I'm still working through um, the ideas that uh, Churchman were pu was publishing in 1950. Well, one of the interesting things I've, I've discovered in, in looking over this in time is uh, I can appreciate the different contexts now, the different time periods. Uh, when we're looking at the Metaphysical Club back in 1890, uh, this is at the emergence of science. And uh, in effect, um, Darwin's a big deal, evolution's a big deal, and the idea that science is separate from God is a big deal. Um, when we go through different generations of pragmatism, uh, the, the next second generation pragmatism, of which um, uh, Edgar Singer was a, uh, a student at that point, uh, psychology was just starting to come in, um, and, uh, and the ideas of of psychology were actually being formed. Um, when you get to churchmen, so, that, so then you end up in, that's actually before World War I, you go through World War I and World War II, and you end up with churchmen actually finishing between the wars, but then Acoff finishing after World War II. Uh, and um, at that point, um, after World War II, the focus shift shifted away from psychology towards sociology. Um, and the sort of things I'm reading in um, in the 1950s work, um, I can see in, you could appreciate after World War II, the world has been decimated. We need to work together to uh, create a better world. And I could see why people would think that way. Um, what I'm thinking now and where my mind is going now is we're way far from that. We're now in the world of uh, of the internet. Uh, it's been a long time since um, The World is Flat has been published, and we could argue about whether uh, The World is Flat, as Tom Friedman says, or The World is Bumpy, as um, Richard Florida says. Um, but in any case, uh, we have this idea now of multinational enterprises. Uh, we have um, China versus the Western world. We have Russia versus the you know, NATO, all these sorts of different um, threads that go on. And so I think that the the lesson that I've, and the conclusion I've come to is that the people who have been focused very much on systems and the idea of wholes and parts, which is organicism, they haven't looked at the full spectrum of philosophies that came from behind, uh, from behind that. Um, and so in particular, Contextualism. Um, I I saw it from Eric Trist expressing it, but it wasn't quite enough. And then um, I've been reading Tim Ingold um, and then Keacock Lee and looking into alternative ways and goes, oh, I see they've actually extended contextualism. So it's like threads that would actually get tied up in knots and then be woven into a texture and then textures get woven with textures. So th there's different approaches. Um, all this kind of leads to the bigger challenge within the system changes learning circle is we have an explainers group uh, because while we're working on the theory, actually working on sciencing and philosophizing at the same time, there's also the real practical issue of getting understandable. And uh, Kelly and Dan are deeply in Zad are deeply involved in trying to make it understandable. Um, so I'm going to leave it at that for a moment. I'm going to ask Dan to moderate as much as he can try to wrangle people. Um, and because uh, uh, I'm going to try to act as a, a participant rather than a moderator in this call. Uh, if people have comments, you can raise hands, you can uh, throw things at Dan or whatever, or Dan can ask.
<laughs> it's not necessary to throw things. However, um, you you have the choice, of course, of putting a question into the chat. You can raise your hand on the thing. So whatever works for you guys will be good. Oh, Zad's the first one to raise his hand, I think, here. So yeah. <clears throat> go. I just wanted to uh start us off, I guess. <laughs> um as we're a quiet group, but like it's helpful to see Gary present some of these ideas. So the questions I'll be asking are as if I'm not part of the group. So I'm sitting outside of myself. But like Gary in the slides, I know that you know there's this transition that occurs about how the expression takes form in traditional uh, Chinese philosophy. And mm -hmm. I was wondering from your perspective, um, you describe something to the effect of like, using that as an example is just a helpful way of how to express contextualism is that because there's a lack of other more expanded upon examples about how contextualism is expressed in systems and that traditional chinese philosophy just happens to be a good fit um where do you see that coming in and how do you see the exploration of of or the utility of that uh, as your own uh, as Gary's own point of view on that uh, use of an example. Well, so I've <clears throat> I've had an interest in um, my limited understanding of Chinese philosophy for some time, Zad, but I certainly have no expertise in it. So it's it's like an, an intriguing alternative. If you start with the people like well, both Tavistock, the pragmatists, you know, James and Peirce and whomever. You can see their exploration essentially pushing back against the backdrop of Western science, right? It's like be because it hangs so heavy, they don't necessarily talk about it, but things like, you know, the, the concept of teleology, the concept that there is some sort of a purpose of the, the transition of things over time rather than they are just purely happenstance. That was completely disallowed in Western science, right? It, it it absolutely demanded objectivity. It demanded that you know things simply be their own causes. But it really it really struggled to come up with a an actual body of alternative ideas, which is why pragmatism really isn't a a set definable alternative philosophy. You've got the, the concepts of you know, Chinese philosophy, if you will, as the foundations of Chinese medicine, Chinese other alternative ways of thinking, but all ways of acting that you know, have thousands of years of history. You've got similar ones you know, in the Vedic system um, coming out of India. Those were longstanding and they are well-developed theories that don't necessarily connect for most people with Western medicine. And so I guess it's a question of, you've got really long-standing other ways of thinking and approaching. You've got more recent um, people, you know, the, the, I would argue that really systems science is an alternative to traditional Western science. It doesn't, reject it, it probably, I would think, encompasses it like you can describe something mechanical absolutely accurately, but it doesn't make everything mechanical, right? I mean, the, the, the first artificial heart was exceptionally mechanical, and it was, it was functional in the way it was, but it didn't make a mechanical heart an organ. And so there are parts of a human body that can be described in fairly mechanical ways, but they're just limited and incomplete. So you can have, I, I think, a whole lot of perspectives that are complementary that, you know, aren't necessarily contradictory. But when you try to get to a larger body of theory to get to something that's much more complete, you need something that's not just limited in a you know, a, a Western cause and effect kind of model. So Does that's that... interesting. Yeah, no, I just, can I, can I paraphrase your Please. answer back to you and yeah. you say, you can see if I captured it, but okay. the, the, the very um, fundamentals of Western science and its orientation limited the range of examples that you could use to express contextualism. 
And so there was a need to go out to longer standing historical traditions that may have a wider vocabulary or conceptual vocabulary that you could use to express it. I think that would capture my view of it pretty well, Zach. Okay, cool. Um, I'm I'm getting a bonus cheating around in here with explainers. I'm like, okay, side <laughs> note, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Let me add on to the idea of uh, of cause and effect as I'm working away, uh, having spent five days on the last blog post, I'm now reviewing and in the idea of um, producer product, because um, I'm, I'm back in methods of inquiry and taking a look at that. And so the the idea of the oak tree, uh, sorry, the acorn becoming the oak tree. So, you know, the and, and the story goes, well, what do you need to create an oak tree? Oh, you need an acorn. Okay, I'll give you orc acorn. Can you guarantee me an oak tree? Oh, no, you need water. You need earth. Okay, I'll give you water, earth, and an acorn. Can you now guarantee me a oak tree? And it goes, it goes on and on. And then the final answer is only God creates trees, right? Um, but that is not cause and effect. That's a, a different approach. So I think Roger was uh, wanting to say something here. Please. You still there, Roger? Get your hand up, so. No. No. All right. Uh, could okay. I could I offer a couple of comments? Uh, in some ways, linking Gary and David, and trying to respond to them. Uh, I, I guess I'll start with where the causal piece comes from. And for me, it came out of Anders Angel, who I like very much in his uh, important distinction between uh, context and environment. And for him, that was a big deal. And I, I liked his big deal. And I liked causal because it, or context, because it was somewhat limited to exchange between parts. There were relationships in a contextual situation whereas environment tends to be everything. And so there are many things out there in the environment you don't relate to, perhaps don't want to relate to, don't even know about, whereas context is much more uh, between things. And, and so I like that distinction very much. And then using that, uh, it was somewhat helpful to try and ascertain uh, what uh, Russell Acuff meant by Singer and one of our courses involved him going one, two, three, four. Going deeply into Singer. And I didn't quite understand. I didn't see the point of Singer based on Russ's lecture. Whereas I later heard one from Churchman talking about the importance of Singer to him. And I found that much more helpful, especially because he allowed for there to be something missing. It, it was not complete. There was something that bothered him about a missing link in Singer that he hadn't got to. And, and that takes us to this 79 book of uh, Churchman, where he brings the enemies into the systems approach to, in essence, liven it up, improve it, make it more, uh, whatever, thoughtful. I, I wouldn't say pragmatic, but to make it more thoughtful. And so I like very much, uh, shall I say, Churchman's approach to Singer much more than Acoff's. In fact, I like Churchman's approach to almost everything more than I liked Acoff's approach. But I, I quite liked Acoff. I, I, I'm not giving him demerits. He gave me demerits, but I didn't give him demerits. And uh, Churchman, I find, uh, there is something missing that he's looking for. There was something more that he's always reaching for, which Akoff always wanted to close things down. You close it down, you send the bill, you move on to the next project. Whereas Churchman could never bring himself to closing that down. And so this area that David and I have been talking about some time of uh, both plus more is the notion of trying to recover from dichotomies, paradoxes of having bipolar life. You have two choices, that's it. 
And so he and I have been playing for some years with the notion of let's join the both and move on to the more. And the more is pretty close to what Churchman was looking for. So that's why he brought the enemies of the systems approach into the discussion. And that's why I liked it also. And I, I don't want you, I don't want to take you into my problems, but I, I'm spending lots of time in what I call the fifth dimension, which is how to recover from the fourth dimension, where for me, the fourth dimension is totally entropy. That time does not define entropy, entropy defines time. Entropy is far more important than time. And then how to make sense of that is how to get to a fifth dimension, which in some ways is <clears throat> a, a dream of a churchman to sort of get beyond this bipolar world and get to a very different kind of world. And so I, I like quite a lot what David and Gary have been raising because it's getting us beyond, oh, shall we say pragmatism, that uh, that in essence, the world did move beyond pragmatism because somehow it was found to be limited or limiting in some funny ways. And actually the other day I found a fantastic book on uh, the difference between rationality and non-rationality and Chinese thought. And this, David, did I send you that title? No. Okay. Later on, I'll run upstairs and bring it down. I'm amazed at that book. And that book on the back has all kinds of credos from Chinese people on how this person understands Chinese philosophy more than Chinese do. And that he was a great hero of many in China for having somehow combined East and West and given, I think, more credit to East than West. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it, it's amazing. I, I sort of can't believe that book. I, I'm trying not to read it, but I'll, I'll, uh, before we're done, I'll run up and, and get it and show you because it has a very Western title extremely western no indication that anything from the east is included and bang you open the first page and there you are and you don't recover it's it's quite good it's pretty close to where i've seen david ng heading in the last couple of years and uh i i, I quite like that book and where david's been working okay Thanks, so david. roger Looks like Roger's got his audio back. So if Roger wants to um, add some comments there. Okay, can you, can you hear me this time? Yep, yes. Ah, uh, good, good, sorry, sorry about that. So, so I, I, I'm reacting in, in, a, in a strange way. So let me explain how I'm reacting, which is um, I know nothing about Chinese philosophy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and almost um, have a little bit of a thing against invoking something else as a as a counterweight to western uh, western science or anglo-saxon science or or however we 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 describe it because um in in in, in, in order to make that distinction you have to draw hard boundaries and in order for there to be hard boundaries there have to be clear definitions that are right. So if 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 I jump forward to that and, and ask um, rhetorically whether any of you have heard of Dennis Noble, um, Dennis Noble is a uh, is a um, he's a, a, a medic um, from 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 Oxford, and he's written a lot about um, why. Uh, the, the simple ideas of Darwin were or, or are misrep misrepresented by what he calls the, the neo-Darwinists. -Dar now, um, he, he, is, um, he, he studies, um, oh God, he studies 
um, stuck, stuck, stuck on the word because it's too close to philosophy. Uh, physiology. Yeah, got it out. He studies physiology, which is the, the whole body phenomenon. And he describes that, um, uh, unlike what we might wish to think in our reductionist mode of neo-Darwinist science, yeah, he, 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 he studies that evolution is both top down and bottom up at the same time. And he makes the case, and if, if you like, I can, I can send you his videos because his videos are all on voices from, from, from Oxford, which, which makes this in a much better way than I can. But, but the basic gist of, of the argument is that um, stresses and learnings in the environment can cause the the uh, the 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 species to change their DNA, and in fact they can they can edit out and they can move great chunks of DNA into different parts of DNA. And so what that means is a lot of the writing and a lot of the loose stuff that we talk about affordances and exaptation and stuff like that have a very clear scientific explanation, but it's not a neo-Darwinist reductionist one. Now, the reason for including all of this is when, when we say, oh, I've got to add to the mix something completely different in order to explain it, yeah, we, we aren't fu fully understanding what it is that we're trying to, 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 to explain. And, and, and as he talks, it, there is, talk, talks about it, there's, there is an attraction of simplicity, an attraction of beauty in the sciences, which is, which is overrated. And so there are certain things that aren't basically simple and you have to do a bit of work to understand it. And what we're doing, what I think a lot of people are doing in their criticism of science and Western science and Anglo-Saxon science, however you, you, you kind of talk about it, is two things. One of which is setting up a stalking horse cup can um, a stalking horse candidate so you can de uh, demolish it and second is they they've not done their their homework on what science is how science works and what science is trying to 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 achieve now Dennis Noble gets into a lot of trouble with very learned people at the Royal Society for saying things like this because there are people like Richard Dawkins who is a neo -Dar Darwinist and he'll just try and wipe the floor with you but but Dennis Noble is such an endearing guy such a clever guy that he, he he stands his ground and makes the case now the reason for including that then is if you look at two simple things one of which is um uh, Noble's ideas of of, of Darwinian e evolution in fact it comes out in later in Darwin's own work that this top-down mechanism as well as the bottom-up Mecha, 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 mechanism are both working at the same time. If you also look at some of the uh, chemistry involved, then the, the, the concepts of things like free energy explain so much of what's talked about in terms of entropy and energy. So what I'm saying is if you went into heavyweight science, you would find an explanation that covered a significant amount of the ground. Now, the interesting thing about what you've done just now, which I think is great, is this historical thread. And the interesting thing about the, the uh, historical thread is that not only did Darwin rec recognize this, but um, Haldane, and I, I don't know if any of you are familiar with the work of, of, of Haldane in the 20s and the 30s, when asked between the, the classic um, Darwin and, and Lamarckian theories, said, well, I believe it's about 20% Lamarckian and 80% Dar Dar Darwinian. Everybody else went on this rather silly winner takes all di dichotomy of, 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 of the classic reductionist Darwin, Darwinism is right and everybody else is wrong. So I think if you allow a plurality in science, you don't end up having to mix in N, 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 anything else. That's not to deny that Chinese philosophy uh, allows plur plurality, and that might be a good vector to bring in plur 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 plurality, but you, you don't need it if you do your, your proper historical analysis. And just to finish off, 
and again, it's very interesting learning about this. Um, the last bit was all about music. Now, the kind of interesting thing about music is that um, music is a, a really good example of um, Ashby's laws of requisite for a variety. When you start to think that um, Ashby's law of requisite for a variety relies on recursion and transduction. And transduction matches exactly into the parts that you get into a musical score. And because requisite for a variety is such an important concept, um, people only sort of take the, the headline without looking into the detail that Ashby de developed both on recursion and transduction. So again, it, it's very interesting that almost embedded in these original works, yeah, is there's so much rich detail that we're only now, uh, now able to, 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 to kind of expose. And, and Noble's crit criticism, which, which I agree, is we are too, too easily jumping on the simple solution yeah, um, without understanding the full depth and the full sort of 3D nature of, of, of what those original people were, were writing about. So sorry, it's a bit of a blast. What I would advise and what I'll do is I'll, I'll post a couple of uh, videos of Dennis Noble talking and just listen to the guy about how he, how he expresses it and how he works through that um, sort of yin yangness, if I can express it like that, of, 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 of what's embedded in Darwin's work. Yeah? It's not the DO Darwinism that you see more and more and more, more, more commonly rep represented, which Noble, Noble talks, the, talks about as re, reductionist Dar, Dar, Darwinism. So thank you for listening, and I'm sure your, 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 your brains are completely burst, but I'll take questions and keep on listening, if that's okay. Okay, uh, let me respond. So I'm only catching up to you on Wikipedia. So I see that Dennis Noble was actually in systems biology. So systems biology is one of the system sciences. If we had Len Troncali with us, we'd be a whole lot better off in discussing this. Um, on the idea of plurality, plurality is something that is within um, pragmatism. Um, but pragmatism, as I saw it, and Gary can uh, also uh, speak to this, um, is from, from my view, with the issues that they were dealing with historically, particularly going through the world wars, um, it's primarily sociology. Um, it, is, it is not system science per se. Um, Gary, do you think that's true? Let, let me take this from a slightly different angle, David. Let's okay. see if we come back to the same place. So responding, Roger, the, <clears throat> you, you described a couple of different um, strains of progress. And they raise issues for a lot of people, right? So you can you can say that there are people who believe that Darwin was really absolutely on the right track. And what we need to do is simply expand on what he had started and we will build out to, you know, a much more robust theory. And, and so it's much better to build on what was a solid foundation and work from there than to consider muddying it with our other ideas. You can pretty much take the same stance about science in general. So Western science, for an awful lot of people, has been so successful in what it's done <clears throat> that it really should not be somehow contaminated with other things that don't fit. It should simply be built upon over time because it will eventually be the, the largest, grandest theory um, that is all that's necessary. But let me step back to um, David Hawke's mention of Singer and Churchman and the idea that it something was missing. Because I think that really is the connection to the pragmatists <clears throat> and a lot of other people. The idea is that it's always incomplete. And it doesn't matter how far it's gotten with whichever theorist, for the most part, they really do understand that they could only get so far even their questions were only so big 
And so he was always going to have to entertain other possibilities. And then the question becomes, how do you take it from there? Do you only build within the bounds of the foundations that have been established, assuming that they will eventually be big enough? Or do you continue to ask bigger questions, which may actually challenge some of the foundations and say that we really need to think more different, bigger in order to encompass more of what we need to understand in the future? Could I add to Gary? Please. That in essence, Gary, uh, some have made the argument that eventually we'll get over Darwin and we'll move on to find something else. And in fact, there's two people I quite like, uh, one preceding, well, I like very much uh, Kropotkin's approach to Darwin. Uh, Kropotkin, of course, which did his work in Siberia, said, of course, Darwin was in one of these sunny islands with all these things running around him in the sunshine. They sort of got bored and decided to fight with each other for a while. So all this fight and combat comes from being in the sunshine and not knowing what to do with it. Whereas if he would come up to Siberia and begin to study some of the same processes, he would find mutual aid as the dynamic force which causes the change that's most valuable in life, not the conflict. And so in essence, Kropotkin wrote quite nice things about uh, how to get over Darwin. But even more effective than that is to read uh, Shargoff's work. I, I don't know if any of you know Shargoff, the biochemist at Columbia. Uh, he wrote the book, Heraclitian Fire. Uh, he was the one that Creek and Watson interviewed because they decided they wanted a Nobel Prize and they didn't know quite what in it. So they interviewed people to see what they knew. And from Shargoff, they found the double helix. And he let it out by mistake, he said, because he felt no one should know about it because they'd make too much of a deal of it because it's one of these parts that sort of doesn't matter, but people will build an entire empire on that silly double helix thing. And so he tried not to explain to Creek what it was, but he said Creek was sort of stupid enough he caught it. Watson didn't, but Creek built on it and they got the Academy Award, I'm sorry, the well, the same thing <laughs> for doing the, uh, no if you're interested, read Heraclitian Fire. It's a fantastic piece on Darwin, Creek and Watson and DNA and how humans have to get over it and get onto something more meaningful. And uh, of course he was hated and really hated at Columbia, probably the most hated professor there, probably the brightest as well. And his work was really quite groundbreaking after he died. As long as he was alive, of course, no one would tolerate anything he did or said. But do, do what, look at Kropotkin, do look at, at uh, Shargoff's work, Heraclitian Fire, and it's pretty wild stuff. And it's going back to the churchman piece of looking for that extra piece that we haven't got it. And perhaps the keynote of humans is they never get it. Then, as it's it's always out there waiting to be gotten. Sorry for all that. Nishan if looks could, angry. <laughs> if 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 I could also um, back up a little bit uh, for for Roger on on the system changes learning project, um, a lot of this is based off as as Gary had done on the first slide is the question about is systems change different or how does it relate to systems thinking? And uh, um, David Hawke often speaks about um, Heraclitus and Parmenides and the question of, you know, what is real, that which changes or that which doesn't change. Um, and if we actually take systems change as real, and so the, the, and the usual accusation is everything's changing, then you can't actually do anything about it. It's like, well, no, it's just our philosophy for looking at it is a little bit weak. So maybe we need to adjust the philosophy. Um, so working towards that direction, um, when I started looking uh, at processual philosophy, um, I actually didn't find um, very much helpful in Western medicine. 
Uh, and, and so the reason I ended up in Chinese medicine, uh, actually Chinese philosophy, originally was with the I Ching, the Book of Changes. Yeah. Now, if you have a book called the Book of Changes, it's like, shouldn't you start there? Uh, but the problem I had with the Book of Changes was that uh, I went and um, uh, this is in a December. There, there was supposed to be an I Ching master uh, in in Toronto. Uh, he's outside Toronto, and people were coming to him and you know getting divinations. And so it's like, what's going on here? And so there's this desire to have, in effect, prophecy. Uh, and I thought, okay, that's over the top. And so let's back down to something that's a little more empirical and more solid. So there is Chinese medicine. Now, you can believe in Chinese medicine or not believe in Chinese medicine, but there must be a science underneath it because they've been repeating it for so long. So, you know, how do we handle that? So um, that, uh, in order to understand Chinese medicine, you have to go into Chinese philosophy, understand yin yang. Um, I've been resisting five elements theory. Uh, I've now gotten back to, oh, five elements is actually four plus one. And the next thing you know, it's four plus one. And then you start doing triads and, and I'm back at I Ching. <laughs> so so I got, I'm back where I started again. Um, but I'm trying to take the uh, the idea of prophecy and forecasting out of it and come back to well, is there a science that we should be looking at that's on a different different philosophical foundation? David Ng and Gary, can I ask a question? Please. So I just been I just been listening to the um, you know to the Zoom call so far, but uh, isn't a lot of this already like uh, stuff that Hegel already covers? Uh, G. W. F. Hegel in his Phenomenology of the Spirit. I know it's a very very uh, tough read, difficult book, but he does go over a lot of these uh, issues and questions, right? Es so, especially opposites and yeah. So you know. so yes, and and so this is where um, really having to get into Chinese philosophy and having a solid base makes a difference. Um, so Keacock Lee makes a differentiation between dialectic and diadem, di dyadics, right? And so in Chinese, Chinese philosophy, and, and again, going to medicine helps, the thing that, we're constant, that I'm constantly trying to grapple with, grapple with is that uh, it's not just opposites. Yin is immaterial and yang, sorry, yin is material, yang is immaterial. And so we don't have that in Western philosophy because we have a separation of mind and body. But if we take an approach that says the mind and body are not separated, it's kind of like, okay, well, what philosophy are you going to base that on? And I'm going, if you keep trying to beat this with Western philosophy, you're going to keep coming back to the same, same issue. So in Chinese philosophy, the most helpful differentiation I have in yin yang is, you know, talk about the human body. It's kind of like, okay, if we talk about rhythms, I can go and go running, you know, full speed for a, a hundred hundred meter, hundred yards. I can't do that forever, right? There's there's a material part, which is my body, the fat I've stored in my body and the muscles and everything going. And there's an immaterial part, which is me putting myself into motion. And and that and so I see that yin yang is oriented around living systems. I don't think it's particularly helpful to talk about yin yang in machines, although we could make metaphors about uh, computer storage versus compute power and those sorts of things. But it's a different philosophy. Um, so the, the distinction between dialectic in Hegel and uh, dyadic thinking um, in Chinese philosophy is one that we're, the explainers group is gonna still have a lot of troubles with that, I can tell. <laughs> if, if you want things to get even worse, Nishat, uh, uh, back in the 70s, I decided to dump cause effect thinking and not be associated with it. So if a project came up that people needed to study causes and effects, I wouldn't take part. That was the first disagreement I had with Akoff because he thought that was more than silly. But anyway, I didn't. And so he asked the alternative. And so I recommended we talk about effect of effects, meaning we go back to the causal texture, meaning that the uh, texture itself 
causes things to happen, which in essence is a set of effects, not a cause. If you insist on what is the cause, you'll be buried you know, six feet deep someplace looking for that cause, and you will have missed the point. And because of that thinking, uh, I encountered my climate change work in 1976. I wouldn't have done that if I thought cause effect made sense. And in fact, in 76, this chief scientist at Exxon, Dr. Black, uh, he snapped onto that immediately because he felt the same. He felt that he could not deal with cause effect thinking. And then he introduced me to this woman of 1856, who was the first to articulate climate change. And in fact, she was of the same ilk that she in fact had made comments that, that you can't use a cause effect to try and understand how uh, in essence, something like climate change can happen from burning coal, but it's very different. And so in essence, that project I did on that ended up in climate change came because I couldn't understand cause effect. My mind somehow isn't up to it. And so I'm back to effective effects. And that in fact is why now some people want to talk to me harshly, not, not nicely. They want to see what the hell's my problem, that I'm getting even worse. I, I wrote a book with dirty words on the chat on the title, and now I'm talking about effective effects. Uh, but but I'm I'm getting to be a little more religious about it. I really uh, I think there is something there. You cannot explain climate change cause effect. Those that do it get lost immediately and sort of kicked off the discussion panel. But uh, whatever they predict is silly. And so I think. I think we're into something by looking there. And I think in terms of David uh, being drawn to the East, uh, it's interesting that AAAS and a foundation in China, regardless of not getting along, have started a new foundation in China uh, called System Sciences, because they believe many answers lie there. And if they can combine East and West under the heading of system sciences, they're into something worth pursuing. And so in essence, they sound like David and Gary. And, uh, and I sort of trust AAAS. They make a lot of mistakes, but they do a lot of good stuff. And, I, and I'm looking forward to that foundation, uh, putting together an agenda of what they're going to study. It's It's... I think quite interesting. And I think, I think uh, we're on to something. Does that help Nishat? No. Did that hurt? I have, I have no idea what you were talking about. <laughs> okay, thank you. I was afraid. Let, let, me try, let me try to build on a piece of that, David, if I don't miss, mess this up and stop me if I am. Um, so let me, let's go back, David, into your, um, the, the I Ching expert. Right. And this guy is professing that he can somehow forecast the future, which is pretty easy to, to dismiss. Right. It's like, OK, this goes back to people using bones and casting lots. That's the, the image. Right. <laughs> to, um, there have been people trying to forecast, predict soothsayers, you know, somehow finding the future for as long as people have been around. Then you get to the promise of Western science about predictability, right? So the whole Newtonian universe was, you know, it, it kind of culminated in this idea that if you could identify at one moment in time every particle in the universe, you could ultimately predict the future because you could see how one would impact the other and create the future based upon the past leading into the present. So you've got the same aspiration, right? It just is coming from a very different foundation about the beliefs about how that may come about. Now you jump to this whole question pressing all of us today about climate 
change and the science behind it. And if you've read some of these gargantuanly long reports from the IPCC that come out every few years, they're you. I don't remember what the term is they use for it, but functionally they're scenario planning, right? They say, given certain parameters, we can kind of guess what those, um, the influences will be. And so that's where you hear all the talk about, you know, if we can keep the average change on the increase of the warmth of the planet to 1.5 degrees centigrade, then we think that only these kind of effects will happen. And then you get scenarios for, you know, all the way up to God knows what. And that's all well and good until you recently get the actual reports about how fast some of the glaciers are melting relative to, oops, that wasn't supposed to happen. <clears throat> and now we're trying to figure out, so what does that mean for what actually is going to happen with things like sea level rise for coastal cities and et cetera? Uh, you know, we, we really want to know what's going to happen. You know, that's a really good goal. Or Kentucky with 45 degrees Celsius. <laughs> yeah, or the fact that I think the one I read today was they, they're now seeing the, the water temperatures yep. around the Keys in Florida mm -hmm. being between 92 and 96 degrees Fahrenheit, right. the water yeah. temperatures. Right. Actually, those 1,200-page documents you're talking about actually pretty interesting and yeah. someplace in there someone picks up on the theme of of suspending cause effect that it obviously is taking us in the wrong direction there's something else going on it's can i ask a question? question yeah who's who's the who's the prime uh, inventor of this cause and effect thinking was it newton or was it even people even before him? Oh, Aristotle said he was, but uh, I think it preceded him. When he thought he was king, he did it. But I think he picked it up from somebody else. So, so let me pick up on, on Greek thinking and Chinese philosophy. Um, one thing that I've discovered along the way, and this is uh, taking Akoff seriously, is synthesis before analysis. Um, and what I've discovered is that um, in Western philosophy, Western science, at a certain point, they want just one. They're trying to find the quark. They're trying to find, you know, one. Mm -hmm. and, and Chinese philosophy, because it's dyadic, there's always two. And you stop and think about this, and like we, we can go to biological examples. It's like, if you want to create a child, it takes two parents of opposite sexes. We can talk about yin and yang there. Um, and so it, it's not reductive. I'm actually finding it um, synthetic all the way down. And it's also synthetic all the way up because, okay, uh, I'm, I'm very hesitant these days in, in, Chinese, in, in when I'm doing Chinese philosophy to use a part whole analogy. Uh, I'm now in everything as a whole, whole alongside whole in time. Oh, yes. And if you want to look at a whole, well, the whole is actually a dyad. So you've got a dyad beside a dyad. And, and, and so for, uh, for people who like things simple, one is simple. But if you can handle two, the next thing you know, you're handling four, and all of a sudden you're into 64, you're back to the I Ching. I'm into three, David, so I'll stick with three. I, I actually found a good book that describes why to create a child, it actually takes three. One of the two partners is thinking about another partner at the time. <laughs> Guys, could I ask a question here? And maybe uh, Zad's on the call, so he might be able to help me too. I mean, I think the thing is being quote, raised in Western culture, I've had a certain orientation, right? And now David's, you know, through his sort of also Western, but now sort of exploring the Chinese culture is kind of helping through that process. However, if we look at civilizations, okay, the Chinese civilization is pretty old, the Greeks one pretty old. 
but also the whole, I don't know if it's the Muslim or that, that culture is very old too. Are there things in there that might help us understand this system changes stuff? I mean, you know, the stuff I love is the Adab stuff, right? Which I don't understand. Okay. So that's an example of something I go, wait a second, maybe we can apply that to help us understand system changes. And I don't know, Adab's rate, uh, you know, Zad's going to raise his hand. So I hope I'm, he's going to help me out here. I'll keep right now. Yeah, thank you, Dan. I think I was thinking something similar, but my short answer is, Dan, they're all the same. <laughs> they're all the, they're all, they're all, um, uh, what would you say, David? They're all like civilizational holes, continuing strands of threads from each other. The Greeks to, uh, sorry, the ancient Indians to the Persians and the Persians to the Greeks and the Greeks back and forward and all over the place across time and space. So, um, yeah, it is interesting un using civilizational as a unit of not analysis, but like synthetic thinking or like a thread, a thread to latch onto. Um, and so David happens to have to be using <clears throat> ancient Chinese philosophy or traditional Chinese philosophy. And Gary explained the reasons why that is, which I think makes sense. But that doesn't disclude the possibilities of referencing other civilizational tra traditions and their ways of thinking that are you know not not disconnected um to also surface um an alternative view world views or contextualist views of the world so my thinking here is that you know people are oriented towards their culture right like i said i was born in a western world so the way i think is western i'm trying to change that right but i think by inviting other like other cultural contexts, whether the right word is other civilizations in the discussion, that make it might make it easier for people to understand and accept some of those and learn some of those things. You know what I mean? Like if you got raised in a certain way and somebody presents that thing in that framing, you might understand it better, right? I, I don't know. I, I'm just trying to throw that out as a as something to ponder. Yeah, I think <clears throat> David Ng and the team, like we'd we'd appreciate that. We uh, I'm starting to realize fragmentation is beneficial um, in a lot of ways in terms of expressing ideas and it's desirable. Um, that bridge, I'm gonna steal this microphone opportunity. That bridges me to this comment about like just this article I saw about, you know, the how like you know, Twitter was once the the world's town square, which is not true. But <clears throat> for a bit, the internet kind of spiraled into this centralizing way. And it was, and David Ng often correct me, it's called internet, you know, like there's, there's a variety of them connected to each other. And I think it's beneficial to return to fragmentation. And I think that that can be helpful for not centrally holding onto um, ideas and allowing the context to create different meanings for different people depending on where they are and how they view the world and how they understand it. So the internet itself is such an interesting phenomenon that, you know, Gary, here's a hypothetical prompt. What would the traditionalist William James and his peers, what would they think of the internet in its different forms? Well, maybe the, um, maybe the better example, even than, Hirsch or, or James for that would have been um, the who was the one of the guys in the metaphysical club, David. That was the um, the judge. Or who Holmes. Yes. Holmes. Oliver Wendell Holmes. Okay. <clears throat> I'll give you a quick, as quick as I can, kind of a snapshot of his story. So, the Oliver Wendell Holmes came from a pretty um, pro prominent family, but he ended up serving in the Civil War. He was wounded and almost died in four different battles in the Civil War. He came out of that with a very clear perspective about kind of humanity and the ideas that drove people to believe they should kill other people who didn't believe the same thing. And so he absolutely was a pluralist in terms of ideas. Uh, and, and the way the story is reported in the book, um, basically, he would fight to the end 
for the right for people in society to express ideas that he had no belief in and no support for, but believed that a healthy society needed to express all of that diversity. And it wasn't that people got to vote on somehow only you know their favorite idea it was the necessity for that diversity that really created an ongoing healthy society that people had to deal with all the other possibilities with each other and i don't know if that answers any part of your question but i think that's kind of a it's an example of how that pragmatism got applied moving away from the idea that there was one absolute right no i think that's i think it's fascinating that that time period has those examples and i would love to do more historical research on the metaphysical club um but almost a uh sci-fi you know gary you've written uh, some alternative mm -hmm. sci-fi um, books and so my sci-fi prompt to you is if at if during that formative time <clears throat> causal and mechanistic thinking didn't take off or didn't take such a strong hold as it did what would the world start to look like <laughs> you know alternative worlds are always speculative Zad, um but you know, it, it it's hard to know if people, let's say that it didn't necessarily lean towards any one other alternative culture or philosophy that we know of, but simply had leaned more towards um, holistic rather than reductionistic kind of approaches over time, how, what, however they had expressed themselves, you know, I'd say one wild possibility is we might have ended up with a somewhat more balanced uh, masculine and feminine kind of view that would be less absolute. Now, how that might have evolved and changed the world, you know, that's a lot of speculation. Yeah, I think I think I channel my Peter Jones when he talks about <clears throat> city states, like Okay. ancient city states and how those were dominant worlds world spheres like you'd go to damascus for trade or you might go to rome for your business or you might go mm -hmm. elsewhere and your understanding of the world dramatically changes based on where you are and the people you relate to but it's yeah. always hard to think forward about what it would look like rather than referencing back i mean that's the that's the impossibility of it but then then this brings up the challenge to um you know, maybe David, I don't know, David Ng, I don't know how good your Chinese history, oh, both of you actually spent a lot of time uh, in China or with Chinese history, but like, if this contextualist, if Chinese philosophy had a st stronger leaning towards a contextualist view, where are they now? And where were they in the past? And what happened at a state level that caused these fluctuations in their own, you could say, quote unquote, harmony? You know, you have the warring states periods and there's a lot of diversity and you have the Ming dynasty and things like that. Like they've all come and gone. So did they not listen, bad pun intended, to their own medicine? Actually, I'd, I'd like to go back to the law analogy um, and how it is in China versus my understanding of how it is in China versus how it is in the West, which is in the West, it's very, very rule based. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is guilty or innocent? like up or down. In China, it's it's actually much more contextual. And so you don't get that. And Westerners find, you know, well, he. so an example would be, well, we arrested this criminal. He's done all these other crimes. We can't prove those ones, but we know he's done this one. So we're going to put him in jail for this one. It's kind of like, you know, so he didn't kill that guy, but he killed these other 10 guys. They're going to put him in jail. Yeah, yeah, because he killed those 10 guys. And we can't prove the 10 guys, but, you know, we have this one, so uh, we'll take that. <laughs> it's like, now, I, if, if, by a Western standard, you kind of go, no, no, you have to prove each one of the 10 guys died. You can't actually say that this guy, you know, this one person was he was accused of killing, you know, wasn't him. But that's just a different standard, right? So the Chinese saying contextualist, it's kind of like, just because we didn't catch him killing 10 guys, it's like, we've got him on this one, so we'll just blame him yeah that legal i like that david the legal example is a good analogy and then it also brings up the question why 
why are the legal examples often the most useful? What is it about the law that makes it such a good synthesis of how people organize themselves? The, the, the law reflects the culture. And so that that's why, um, so, so Gary can talk more about Oliver Wendell Holmes, but, and the history to me is actually getting quite important in understanding, because um, the Metaphysical Club is written about the period after the American Civil War. Gary? Well, the, the question about law, I think is because it it is, so let's try to contrast just for a second law versus science. Because I, th I think they are interesting juxtapositions. <clears throat> Back a bit, Nishat, to your question about, you know, this whole roots of cause and effect. Um, I think a piece of it you can draw back to Thagoras and the whole idea that the universe is really represented in mathematical terms. Now, that creates a vision of the universe that becomes pretty absolute, and that's a lot of the foundation for science in some ways. <clears throat> it also leads to logic. And logic is things like, you know, you something cannot be both and, fundamentally, right? It, it, it is either this or that in order for the logic to work. And from logic, then you begin to extrapolate into things like cause and effect, the, the descriptions from a certain viewpoint about how, how things are, which can be mathematically described. There's basically nothing in the law that really adheres to a mathematical description. It is, you know, there are human judgments there are, but it is processual over time in that the law is often based upon previous precedent, or it's based on some kind of larger judgment of whatever, but things like in the West. So the, the U.S. is a contractually based um, <clears throat> business societal organization, right? I would say that fundamentally Americans don't trust each other. So they, instead of acting by agreement, they act by contract where you can always, you know, sue the other person, but we don't really fundamentally have much trust in each other. So you have contracts. Well, a law and a contract and any other legal precedent are inherently incomplete. There is absolutely no way to completely describe any one situation or example that is, you know, without further exception. And so in the law, it is always evolving as much as it may be absolute at a point in time. It is always subject to interpretation and it is always subject to ongoing fluctuation. That's a good recorded clip to cut and post online. <laughs> No. Do you, do you want an example of why law is so bad and why I avoid it? Uh, I, th I think the Wall Street Journal did an article about this, so I could try and look that up. But uh, what, 20 years ago, when I was working for uh, China State Construction, I was trying to get them to learn more about the West and not do like the Japanese where after three years they bailed out and went the hell home. They said, you know, how could people live in this country, let alone do business? And so I tried to get the Chinese to stick with it. And so I needed to find an American firm for them to buy and join within their company. And so my rule for doing it was that uh, I would find a company which I did, uh, China construction was 200 billion. The company was 5 billion. So it was a small company in comparison they were going to acquire. And my rule was that there could be no lawyer from either side present during any of the discussions till the very end. Then a lawyer could review the agreement and make comments on whether it should be modified or not but no lawyers were allowed in any room where any discussion was taking place 
on the acquisition or the merger. And indeed, we spent about a year doing that. I was in charge of due process and we worked out an agreement and the uh, both sides uh, at the end were fantastically happy with how they related to each other and how they worked. And then I pointed out if lawyers had been present, they would find all kinds of problems for you to worry about and be prepared to hire them at some future date to come solve that problem. But indeed we had none of that by the law being missing and particularly the lawyers representing whatever they called the law in the process. <clears throat> and then Wall Street Journal did an article that this was considered one of the most successful mergers they knew of in the New York, New York City area, perhaps in the US. And that continues to this day as an incredibly successful merger, but no laws and no laws were allowed in the discussion till the two sides drew up a contract without lawyers. Is that bad, Gary? No, I'd say it, it poses the question about, so what role does the law and the lawyers play in what fundamentally end up being relationships? You know, well, that, so that's an easy one because in the US, uh, on average, we have five to 10 times as many lawyers per capita as our trading partners. And so people in the US that look at that say, what the hell do we have all those lawyers for? And then the question, well, I don't know. Because outside, uh, say in European countries, they don't have them. They're, they're rare in comparison. So what is it they do? And uh, what I think they do is make work. They look for an avenue to make work in the future. And when they interpret the law, they do it so cynically. It's, it's good to laugh at, but if you're paying for it, it's tough. And if you have two organizations merging, the payment, uh, the punishment goes on and on and on. It, it, it's almost never over and the lawyers come and go. Yeah. So I think there's an argument to be made that the functionality of lawyers in these situations has something to do with mitigating risk, meaning you set up a contract by where blame can be assigned. And therefore, it in theory mitigates the risk of one party against the other. <clears throat> in reality, it simply multiplies all the costs and it really damages the relationships and in effect, the organizations ultimately have to function by relationship anyway. So you now start having law bump into things like prediction of mitigation of risk, which in theory happens in all kinds of arenas, including things like insurance. And it never, you never end up mitigating the actual risk, um, whatever the mediator is supposed to be. Also, what you just, just described, Gary, was just like a PhD defense, which I was at a few days ago. But, uh, <laughs> um, wow. <laughs> well, actually, a two. One with a very good student that went badly, and one with a very bad student that went well, because he referenced the right people. But the discussion had all to do with what you just said. It, uh, and it didn't have any lawyers in the room. And uh, yeah, it's tough out there. Yeah. So a, a thread I'm picking up in Churchman, Singer and Churchman, um, so this non-relativistic pragmatism, which is not all of pragmatism, uh, but is just this one thread, is the question about separation of facts and values. Mm -hmm. And so in effect, um, the, 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 the part that I, I like is we, he starts off in discussing science and saying, well, if science is supposed to be objective, then every scientist that would ever do the experiment should get the same result. But then it's like, well, why do you need scientists? You should actually have idiots do the testing because they should get the same results as a scientist. So then you're saying, well, no, then scientists have value. Uh, okay, then you haven't separated out factor value because in deciding to do the experiment, who designed that experiment and all those sorts of things come on. Mm -hmm. um, 
from there, there's actually a long exposition where they left off in the blog post where he starts talking about history. And is there an absolute fact in history without value? Um, and so I'm understanding now a little bit more uh, revisions of history and that the, the victors get to write history. So David, I picked up the book upstairs that I, I wanted to run by the group, or at least we, and the title, the author is A.C. Graham. He died, I think, 2021 or something, or was born 1919. Uh, the book is Unreason Within Reason. Subtitle is Essays on the Outskirts of Rationality. And so the first chapter or two, he wanders around in Western rationality, trying to understand uh, Hegel, et cetera, et cetera, and what they sort of mean. And then he gives up and skips to China. And the rest is mostly on China, on why they didn't get buried in the problems that we raised in the West and why, in essence, they have a very interesting language for avoiding the Western language of doing what we do. And so three-fourths of this is devoted to what he learned. And he claims that he acts this way because he was very much a rationalist as a religious person. It came from his feeling about God. So he went to Oxford and got a degree in theology and studied theology to the core and found it was extremely wanting. <laughs> the more he studied, the more disappointed he became. And so then he branched off into others and was still disappointed. And until he got to the East, he never found what he was looking for. And then it began to appear. And so he sounds like an early version of a David Ng looking at the uh, uh, beginning with the language of the East and then going through the thought process of the East and why it's uh, distinctly informative to him. And it made up for everything he missed at Oxford. It's, it's quite a good piece. And I don't understand his diagrams, but that's okay. <laughs> A.C. Graham is, is one of the sources we've used for Yin Yang. He has other books where he, he and in the appendix for um, the article in JIS, uh, JSCI, um, he's one of the people that I, I cite because he actually tries to describe Yin and Yang um, in, in the categories. Okay. Um, so, so yes, right, right direction. The book that you're talking about is like practically uh, unattainable. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yes, it's, you now have a rare book. Uh, it's, oh, really? It's really, really hard to find. I've had it for got some one, time. Got one it it cost seven ninety five back when it was sold. But I, I had not really opened it. And, and then I was in the middle of a fight on rational and irrational and gave up and went off and began to look through this. And it had very little to do with rational, irrational. It's well beyond that, much better than that. And I, I just changed my mind and stopped arguing and, and really enjoyed this book. He's quite good. You found a copy, Gary? One on Amazon left at the moment. <laughs> how, how much? Uh, what for it? $29. Oh, not bad. Not bad. Anyway, I think we're on to something, but we don't have the terminology to describe it very well. Yes, and, uh, and, and we need the explainers group to help us out with that. <laughs> that's, that's true. And I, I wish China had a different leader, but uh, uh, anyway, I've been told I won't be allowed to go back. And yeah. so- Well, the, also modern China is not, um, classical China, uh, Chinese philosophy. So um, it, it's hard to, to, to make that bridge today. But at, at Tsinghua, there were some holdouts that thought they were in ancient China and were doing very well. 
but now some pressure has been applied to them to be a little careful, whatever that means. And, what, uh, what about what about South South Korea uh, or Taiwan, etc.? I mean, they don't they don't really have it. I think they're very Confucian, though. I mean, the ma major populace tends to be. Yeah. So so if you're going to be true to Yin Yang, the the Taoists are closer. Um, but again, I'm really trying to. Um, I, I'm following the pragmatic tradition in that I'm coming in through science. Um, the uh, the ethics. Now, this, this is something that Churchman comes into um, with the facts and value argument is that you can't separate facts and value. And so while I'm approaching science, then you end up with uh, Churchman talking about the four ideals, uh, plenty, um, the good, uh, you know, th this sort of thing. So all of a sudden it's like, while we try to stay in science, uh, it it really drifts outside that. Yes, yes. Uh... Yes, this book has many of those categories and dichotomies put in different terminology, mm -hmm. uh, almost street terminology, but uh, uh, quite humorous. Mm -hmm. Like the difference between decaying and dead <laughs> is one of his charts. Uh, quite, quite. Uh, night, sickness, corpse, uh, et cetera. He's uh, he's looking for a uh, yeah. But I, I I I like very much what you were raising in today's uh, discourse. I, I just uh, and it all goes back to the idea of what's happened to systems thinking, and back to the issue that you know Gary and David are both concerned with, and uh, is that a good question or not? And uh, you know and. And then the second is, who cares? And some of us do care. But uh, as, I, as I've pointed out in other discussions, when I find someone argues for neg entropy, I get worried. And uh, certainly Eric and uh, Emery argued for it on the first page of that chapter I like so much. And almost everybody else, including Ashby, Ashby argued for the importance of neg entropy. So anybody that wanted an open system used neg entropy as an argument for why they had it. And I think they missed it. And I, I think I'm able to uh, show why that's a mistake. Well, let me let me close with this comment: open and close is not a concept we actually discuss within contextualism because it's holes and holes. And so, you know, open or close to what? Your holes beside yep. each other. <laughs> and, and in my latest book, the distinction between hole with a W and an H is important too. And so black holes is the next stage after a turbulent environment. And that is a hole. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap up for today. Um, I'm going to set the expectation for next month. Uh, unfortunately, the people who are at a distance will not attend because the plan is to have Judith Rosen come to Toronto and uh, we'll have a meeting in person. So the next time we see some of you will be in uh, September. Um, we set up another system thinking Ontario. So thanks for everybody. We'll see the recordings. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.